Right. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, um, for those of you that are online now, uh, welcome to these sessions. Um, these are hosted by Gecko, and this is co-hosted by the Gecko Foundation um, in association with Project Echo. We have these sessions every second Monday at 6 p.m., and these are exclusively for teaching, which is different from our Wednesday meetings. Um, the chat will be open for questions. So when uh, Jessica has finished presenting, please feel free to put uh, your chat questions uh, in the chat box, or alternatively, you can just put your hand up and uh, we'll ask you to unmute and ask your question. So you might remember that some time ago, uh, Jessica had prepared a talk, but due to uh, technical issues, was unable to present. Nasif and Escape uh, luckily came to the rescue, but uh, I felt that it was only fair that we give Jessica an opportunity to do her presentation since she had spent so much time preparing it. But I also think, think that this is such a difficult topic and the patients are really difficult to manage and they're very heterogeneous, not always difficult, not always easy to make a, a definitive diagnosis. So I think it's worth repeating uh, this topic of GERD uh, and NERD. So Jessica, uh, if you're ready, please uh, share your uh, presentation uh, and over to you. And thank you once again for, for, for preparing this. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm Jessica Wing. I'm a fellow at Fitz Donald Gordon Medical Center and Charlotte McRae at Johannesburg Academic Hospital. And tonight I'm going to be speaking about gastroesophageal reflux disease. And like Prof said, it's a very vast, broad topic. It's the bread and butter of our subspeciality, but it's often overlooked. So I think the aim of my talk today is just going to hopefully get the audience to view um, GORD as a unique disease phenotype in each patient um, that's different in each patient. And that could help us with the different pathophysiologies and thereby um, help us understand it a little bit better in order to preci preci precisely target um, our treatment approach in each individual patient. So let's move on to um, our layout. So I'm gonna just quickly go through the definitions in epidemiology, then our risk factors, clinical features and associations, pathophysiology, which I'm gonna spend a lot of time on and the bulk of the presentation will be on pathophysiology and the implications of management thereof. Then a recap on the diagnosis with the new Leon consensus, um, complications, management, and then a few slides on refractory board. Okay, so definitions in epidemiology. So previously the Montreal consensus just required the understanding of reflux of the stomach contents into the esophagus causing troublesome symptoms and or complications. But with the new Leon consensus, we now need conclusive evidence and that's the crux of the matter. So you need reflux related pathology on endoscopy and on your pH monitoring, which we'll elaborate on later in the presence of compatible symptoms. And these symptoms have to be typical symptoms, which I again will elaborate on later. So in terms of epidemiology from global um, pooled studies, we know that the prevalence is around 30% and our prevalence is highest in Southeast Asia and in um, Southeast Europe, oops, sorry. Um, there's no prevalence data, unfortunately, from Africa, and it accounts for about 110,000 admissions in um, in the, the USA hospitals annually. Okay, so risk factors, genetic risk factors, there have been reports of some familial clustering um, of gourd and varus esophagus, and there have been some twin studies in Sweden and the USA to suggest that there is a gen genetic liability for gourd to be around 30 to 40%, but not really that well established. And then possibly raise it to smooth muscle disorders associated with um, reduced LES pressures, hiatal hernias, and impaired motility. And in terms of environmental, everybody thinks that tobacco and alcohol consumption have a strong association, but actually there's a very weak association with GERD symptoms. But tobacco is a risk factor for erosive esophagitis and adenocarcinoma. So that's where the difference is. In clinical features, what I was alluding to earlier is typical symptoms are only two. So it's heartburn or esophageal chest pain for more than two days of the week. And then regurgitation, which is the perception of effortless flow of gastric content into the mouth. Your less typical symptoms, which weren't delineated in the earlier consensus, was water brass, which is, um, if for people that don't know, it's a salty fluid that is ejected from the saliva glands into the mouth um, in response to esophageal mucosa being um exposed to acid, then adenophagia, and then dysphagia. In terms of the less common extraesophageal symptoms, that's all of your pulmonary manifestations, so asthma, a chronic cough, 
aspiration ammonia, bronchiectasis, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, chronic bronchitis, and then sleep disorders such as um, obstructive sleep apnea, and then posterior laryngitis. Okay, so strong associations we know in, in, are in pregnancy in the first trimester, systemic scleroderma, zollinger ellison syndrome, and prolonged nasogastric tube intubation, and also post hellers myotomy or poor oral endoscopic myotomy or POM for our achalasia patients, and then post-bariatric surgery. So when we are um, encountering a patient with these symptoms, you need to think of other differential diagnoses. So esophageal would be your Zenkis diverticulum, motility disorders such as achalasia, and then eosinophilic esophagitis are the major ones. And in terms of other things outside of our esophageal realm, it would be gastroparesis, cholelithiasis, peptic ulcer disease, and then functional dyspepsia or disorders of the gut-brain interactions, and then angina pectoris. Okay, so looking at the pathogenesis, this is uh, the meat of our presentation. So it derives from basically an imbalance between two major columns. The first is your esophageal defense factors, which are made up of your anti-reflux barrier, your esophageal clearance mechanisms, and then your tissue resistance of your esophageal mucosa. And then with aggressive factors, refluxing from the stomach. So gastric acidity, the degree of the gastric volume, and then if there's duodenal content or not. So looking at our anti-reflux barrier, the three anatomical structures that make this up is, are the intrinsic lower esophageal sphincter and its intra-abdominal location, the diaphragmatic crura and the freno esophageal ligaments, and the acute angle of his. This will determine the volume and frequency of esophageal reflux episodes. Okay, so the four mechanisms by which your anti-reflux barrier will fail is one, a decreased basal um, lower esophageal sphincter pressure, and then transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, swallow associated LES relaxations, and the hiatal hernia. So we'll go through each of these briefly um, and hopefully gain more understanding. Okay, so this is the most common mechanism in patients with healthy, healthy sphincter pressures and in patients with GORD, so about 50 to 80%. These are the transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations. So they occur independent of swallowing and they are not accompanied by peristalsis. They're quite long, they're about 10 seconds. The diaphragmatic are importantly are inhibited by these, by these relaxations. So you don't get that second anti-reflex um, barrier mechanism in place. Stretch of your proximal stomach um, by either gas or food is the major stimulus for your transient relaxations. And then other various stimuli, so pharyngeal stimulation, dietary fats, stress, um, can all cause transient relaxations. Inhibited by anticholinergic drugs, GABA agonists, which come into big um, into our management, um, serotonin antagonists, um, morphines, cholecystokinin, and one receptor antagonists. Okay. Then looking at swallow-induced lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. So these are quite uncommon. They're responsible for only about 5 to 10% of reflux episodes. They're uncommon because they're accompanied by pleural contraction. They're shorter, around 5 seconds each, and they're prevented by an oncoming peristaltic wave. So this means that if you have um, swallow-induced uh, lower esophageal sphincter relaxation um, as your major mechanism for Board, it means that you have defective or incomplete peristalsis. That's the key from the slide. It's more common when it's associated with a hiatus hernia. Then our, fourth, our third mechanism would be an intrinsic hypotensive lower esophageal sphincter. And there's two mechanisms, whether it's strain-induced or free reflux. So strain-induced would be someone that has a relatively hypotensive lower esophageal sphincter, and that's overcome by an abrupt increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. So coughing, bending, any valsalva maneuver. So that's the more common um, mechanism. Then free reflux is quite rare. That's characterized by a decrease in your esophageal pH without any changes in your intragastric pressure. So there's free flow. And that normally happens when your LES pressure is less than five millimeters of um, five millimeters. It's uncommon in end stage systemic sclerosis or after myotomy for achalasia. Those are the two main settings where you'd see this. And on endoscopy, see, on endoscopy, you'll see severe esophagitis as a clue. This is from our, May, our the fellow textbook that we use, Slizinger's and Fodrans. And so this is a nice table just elucidating some of the hormones, neural agents, foods, nutrients, and other factors that will increase your alias pressure and decrease your alias pressure. So as you can see over here, baclofen is something that I'll mention later, um, which decreases your transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation episodes. Okay. Then our last mechanism, um, which results in failure of the anti-reflux barrier is the hiatal hernia. 
So this is very common. It's around half to about 94% of patients with es esophagitis. They become more significant if they're non-reducible and large, so more than three centimeters in terms of their pathophysiology. They displace the lower esophageal sphincter away from the cura. They reduce the basal pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter, shorten the length of the high pressure zone. They eliminate the increase in the alias pressure during straining and increase um, your episodes of transient relaxations, also increasing the compliance of the esophageal gastric junction. And then they result in persistent vestibule of the gastric acid pocket, acid pocket resulting in re-refluxate, impairing esophageal clearance. So multiple mechanisms for why they would cause gastroesophageal reflux and why they are a major um, mechanism in terms of the failure of the anti-beef reflux barrier. Okay, so this is just a quick slide from, in terms of the first column of anti-reflux barrier failure mechanisms. So something I came across is prucalopride, which is a prokinetic that we can use if there is a decrease in your free reflux lower esophageal sphincter pressure, and that's if it's very low. I haven't come into contact with it, but it's an, um, something that can be used. And in terms of your hiatal hernia, we'll move on to other slides later to um, elucidate more on that. This is just a quick, and I'll elucidate further on in management of what to do. Okay, so this is baclofen. Um, it's a GABA receptor agonist. This is has been shown to work um, in your transient lower sphincter esophageal reflux mechanism. So it's an object an adjunct to PPIs, but its side effects have been limiting. So it, it's useful if you've got transient lower esophageal um, sphincter relaxation episodes as your major mechanism. Okay, this is going through the hiatal hernias. So just for everyone to, ref to refresh them, it's the heel grade. So this would be grade one. This would be grade two, where you can see there's a slight opening. The ridge is more prominent. Grade three, you can see there is a larger opening on retroflexion and then free uh, large obvious hernia in grade four. Um, the reason why I concluded this slide is because for grades one and two, you can manage them with medical management. They have a higher likelihood of responding. And if it's a grade three and four, larger than three centimeters, um, fixed mechanical defect, your threshold to escalate to reflux surgery is lower. Okay. So now we're going on to the next column of pathophysiology. So we've done the anti-reflux, the anti-reflux barrier failure mechanisms, those four mechanisms. Now we'll go on to esophageal clearance. So unlike the anti-reflux barrier um, mechanism, which determines your frequency and the number of episodes, this this determines the duration of acid exposure to the esophageal mucosa and the severity of mucosal damage. So this is actually one of the more important mechanisms. So there's volume clearance and um, then the library and esophageal gland-based clearance. So volume clearance is the actual bolus clearance. So that's peristaltic dysfunction. If you have failed or weak peristaltic contractions, so less than 30 millimeters. Then um, salivary and um, esophageal gland-based titration. So after you've had your peristaltic wave, you should have salivary and esophageal gland-based um, excretion, and this should um, neutralize your, your acid after and the peristaltic wave. And it's stimulated mainly by acid in a proximal LES, so between, I mean, proximal esophagus, which is about 20 centimeters above the LES. So the implications for management here would mainly be in all in simple things like in the older population and patients taking anticholinergics or in patients with Sjogren's, um, with less with dry mild and xerostomia, um, you won't have your chemical clearance. And then obviously in your patients with systemic scleroderma and motility disorders, you'll have failure of esophageal clearance mechanisms. Okay, so looking at tissue resistance, there's pre-epithelial factors, epithelial and then post-epithelial factors. So pre-epithelial factors would be esophageal secretions of prostaglandin E2 and then mucin or glycoconjugates. Epithelial factors, which be your transmembrane protein exchange channels, which maintain your intracellular pH, but your most important in terms of histological diagnosis are your tight junctions. So in both um, non-erosive and erosive gastroesophageal disease, you'll see dilated intracellular spaces um, if you look under the microscope. Um, and then in terms of your post-epithelial factors, esophageal blood flow transporting your nutrients, oxygen and carbon dioxide and removing your hydrogen ions increases response to luminal acid. So these are all your tissue resistance factors that need to be in place to protect you from board. Okay, so 
In terms of non-erosive gastrous, um, non-erosive reflux disease, 77% of patients, this is in 70% of patients with board, they have specific microscopic alterations in the mucosa. So the integrity of your tight apical intracellular junctions are um, impaired, and you'll see increased permeability with dilated spaces on histology. Um, it's the, so the reason you, the patients with NERD are sometimes more symptomatic than those with erosive esophagitis because this, they have the superficial sensory nerves are more superficial and are activated by your hydrogen ions much easily because they're at a superficial level. Whereas patients with esophageal reflux disease have deeper sensory nerves. So they'll have extensive disease on endoscopy, but won't be as symptomatic. So for them, you'll see basal cell hyperplasia on the microscope um, where you get um, traditional the traditional acid burn theory. So you'll get acid exposure and then cellular death, and then you'll get cell recruitment and then increase um, basal cell hyperplasia. However, that's been challenged. Now um, there's a theory of where you have refluxate that indirectly stimulates T cell infiltration into the submucosa. And via chemotaxis, you have inflammatory cells and then cell death is mediated this way. Then implications for management here, this is just to say that you need to optimize your PPI, but we'll go into management later for time-saving purposes. Okay, moving on from esophageal factors. So we've done the anti-reflux barrier, we've done the esophageal clearance and our tissue factors. We'll go on to our gastric factors. So the acid pocket is an area, sorry, let me just get there, just below the OG junction, which escapes the buffering effect of meals. This allows a lot of chronic short segment acid, acid reflux episodes. And then H. pylori, so gastritis of the corpus, if they're CAG A positive, they can be protective. So you get gastric atrophy and less acid secretion, um, as well as ammonia production by bacteria and increased gastric alkaline secretion. If you have H. pylori infection in the antrum, it's the opposite. You'd have increased gastrin, thereby increasing the risk of gourd. Okay. Okay, then in terms of motility, abnormal fundal accommodation of the proximal stomach, prolonged postprandial fundal relaxation and delay in the recovery tone, um, tonic tone, as well um, has been shown that there may be some correlation, although poor, around 40% of patients with, with gourd. It seems not to be um, a fact of total acid, acid exposure, but rather a major factor in contributing to the proximal extent of the reflux, which um, correlates with more symptoms. So the more proximal um, reflux you get in the esophagus, um, the more um, symptomatic one becomes. And then women and diabetics are more likely to have gastroparesis and secondary reflux, but there is a poor correlation in patients with board. It seems to be a secondary cause only. Okay, so implications for management here, I just wanted to highlight that um, although H. pylori is associated with a lower prevalence of reflux, we still need to treat it because it's strongly linked um, to gastric anocarcinoma. So just to make that clear for everybody. Okay, then looking at the refluxate, if your acid is less than four, your perception of heartburn and regurgitation is increased um, with more prolonged and proximal exposure, like I said, for gastric motility, with more proximal exposure um, of, the, of acid, the more symptomatic ones becomes, and then the more um, damage to esophageal mucosa, especially if bile acids are present. If it's weakly acidic or non-acidic, so if the patient is on a PPI, it doesn't cause mucosal damage, but it's implicated in chronic cough and regurgitation. And then gas reflux is um, usually super gastric or gastric, usually your transient lower esophageal um, sphincter relaxations, just to keep that in mind, it might be a cause of refractory gourd. Okay, then looking at the refluxate, bowel reflexate is more severe, um, it causes more severe esophageal damage, increases mucosal permeability and dilatation of the intracellular spaces and hydrogen ion absorption, and induces a, a reactive oxygen species. It's associated more with Barrett's esophagus and erosive esophagitis with an increased expression of your interleukin-2, 8, TNF, and COX-2, so inflammatory cytokines. All right. So I'll move on. Then in terms of your perception of esophageal symptoms, um, this is also a important um, contributing factor in the pathophysiology. So your psychoneuroimmune modulation factors, so stress, sleep deprivation, and then hypersensitivity of your esophageal nerves via those, intra, uh, those dilated intracellular spaces, um, we shouldn't forget. And in terms of hypervigilant, this is just autonomic system arousal. And once again, it can be a cause of refractory board. Um, just to let you know over there that psychological manage management and hypervigilance can be useful. 
Okay, then looking at obesity, so BMI is directly proportional to the prevalence of gourd symptoms and esophagitis. For every unit of BMI increase, the time whereby the distal esophageal pH is less than four actually increases by about 0.35%. Um, reasons for this is because there's increased intragastric pressure, it overwhelms the anti-reflux barrier, increases prevalence of ahetal hernias and all those mechanisms we went through. Um, it decreases your lower esophageal sphincter pressure, your visceral fat actually should secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines, high caloric meals are also associated with delayed gastric emptying, increased frequency in your transient lower esophageal um, sphincter relaxation episodes, and fundic distension. And just to note that hormonal changes also predispose you to gourd related complications such as uh, esophageal cancer because of those um, inflammatory cytokines that are secreted from the visceral fat. Then sleeve gastrectomy, so even if you treated for um, your obesity, it's, it's still increased with broad symptoms, esophagitis, and prevalence of Barrett's esophagus. Okay, so now getting onto the diagnosis. So we've gone through the pathophysiology. The crux of the slide, I think, is just to, um, re uh, just to um, reaffirm that you have to have typical symptoms. So esophageal chest pain and regurgitation are the only two typical symptoms. If you have these two, you can be allowed to have an empiric trial of anti-secretory therapy. And then if these do not work, to go on to endoscopy and wireless monitoring. If you have more atypical symptoms that we went through, adenophagia, water brush, any of the extra esophageal manifestations, you can't give a trial of PPI or anti-secretory therapy. You need to do more extensive and um, investigating and get conclusive evidence. So doing endoscopy and impedance monitoring. Okay, so what constitutes conclusive evidence? On endoscopy, it's LA grades B, C, and D. Um, esophagitis, if you have biopsy proven Barrett's esophagus, and if there's presence of a peptic stricture. So in unproven GERD, you should only perform um, endoscopy around two to four weeks off anti-secretory therapy. And if it's LA grade B or higher, and you've seen a recurrent stricture while on optimized PPI or anti-secretory therapy, that's indicative of refractory board. So only these three, B, LA grades A, B, and um, B, C, and D, but obviously proven Barrett's esophagus, and then a presence of a peptic stricture, stricture um, constitutes as, as conclusive evidence. This is just a reminder for everyone in the audience about your Los Angeles classification. So Los Angeles A, B, C, and D, we, so B, C, and D would constitute as conclusive evidence. And then a reminder of what a peptic stricture looks like, Barrett's esophagus looks like, and then esophageal adenocarcinoma. Okay, getting onto ambulatory reflux monitoring. So prolonged wireless pH monitoring of anti-secretory therapy. This is our gold standard. It provides the highest diagnostic yield and your study duration is usually about 96 hours. It determines your dominant physiological versus pathological acid exposure time. Um, it's not widely available. We don't use it at Charlotte or at Don Gordon. Um, we use a catheter-based pH monitoring, and that is a viable alternative. Your thresholds in the Leon consensus um, are defined as follows. So if your acid exposure time is less than four on all of your days with a negative reflux symptom association, that will exclude gourd. If it's between, if it's more than six and it's for more than two days of that study period, it's diagnostic. If it's less than 4%, but there is po positive reflux symptom association, that will meet criteria for reflux hypersensitivity. And then your acid exposure time between four and six is considered inconclusive and you'll need further clinic, um, testing in a, in a clinical context. Okay, then looking at impedance monitoring, which we have access to. So that has diagnostic value in an unproven board when you are off anti-secretory therapy, particularly when your reflux symptoms are associated with excessive bulging. So it's actually the gold standard for super gastric bulging. And then if you're concerned about if there's rumination and if there's pulmonary symptoms. So it's useful because uh, there are more reflex episodes that are detected. So you have the impedance component plus um, your pH monitoring. So that adds more sensitivity in terms of um, reporting the number of reflex episodes. However, it does need expert interpretation to overcome inaccurate auto automated analysis. So it shifts the diagnosis away from those that have functional heartburn to reflex hypersensitivity. Um, it's also valuable in patients that have proven good on a PPI with persisting symptoms. So it aids in decision-making whether you should escalate beyond pharmacotherapy. And these are some of the thresholds. So if your total um, acid exposure time is more than six, it's diagnostic of pathological good. 
if you're having less than 40 reflux episodes a day on the impedance component, that's adjunctive episodes for that um, absence of board. And if it's more than 80 per day, it's adjunctive evidence for, for board. If it's between 40 and 80 or for PPI, it's inconclusive. And then you can use other measures on that, such as your ohms or your resistance. So if it's more than 2,500, that's against good. If it's less than 1,500, it's for good. Okay. Then esophageal manometry, it's not typically indicated in the evaluation of uncomplicated GERD. It's helpful when we locate the LES, when we place the impedance catheter, and it gives us markers of GERD. So it tells us when there's um, compromised esophageal peristaltic um, function that may be causing the symptoms, if there's abnormal um, esophageal gastric junction morphology and barrier function with failure of the anti-reflux barrier mechanisms that we went through. It helps us with refractory symptoms um, or, or broad as well. So if there's motility disorders and not necessarily broad, and then are documenting adequate peristalsis, excluding achalasia and scleroderma, and it is an essential before anti-reflux surgery. So looking at complications, so very uncommon to have non-cancer GERD-related deaths, such as hemorrhagic as, um, esophagitis, ulcer perforation and rupture, and aspiration pneumonia. We're mainly looking at esophageal strictures and Barrett's esophagus. So esophageal strictures, they occur in about 70 to 23% of untreated reflux esophagitis, usually in older men with chronic NSAID use. Um, endoscopically, they smooth wall, tapered um, circumferential narrowing in the distal esophagus, usually around one to two centimeters, so they can be about eight centimeters long. They can be complex, ranging from reversible inflammation to irreversible fibrosis. And in terms of the treatment, if it's less than your scope size, so your scope is 12 millimeters, if it's less than 13 um, millimeters, you need to have dilatation. So it's short and simple, you can do blind dilatation. If it's longer and more complicated, which what we which what we do at the gen, we bougenage over guide wire, guide wire using a hollow centered or balloon dilator, um, preferably with fluoroscopy, and then maintenance PPI therapy, and then recalcitrant strictures. Um, we use self expanding plastic stents or intralesional steroid injections. Okay, so just a quick mention on Barrett's esophagus because I know we're getting a nice talk next week on that. Um, it's a complication of gastroesophageal reflux disease and a risk factor of esophageal adenocarcinoma. It's results from metaplasia of your stratified squamous cells of the distal esophagus to the columnar cells. And treatment involves optimizing PPIs. And if there's dysplasia, we move on to endoscopic ablative therapy. Okay, getting on to um, management. So this is just a nice um, slide explaining where we start. So as I said in the beginning, the more tip atypical your symptoms are, the higher need for documentation of normal reflux burden is before you start a long-term treatment. So conclusive evidence is required. Okay, we can try lifestyle measures such as diaphragmatic breathing, hypnotherapy, or, or acupuncture. I haven't personally tried these in any patients. Um, I'm more comfortable with the pharmacotherapy. So over-the-counter medications, antiacids, alginates, moving on to um, histamine receptor antagonists, then our mainstay, which is your PPI or your proton pump inhibitors, and then the new kid on the block, the potassium um, competitive acid blockers, and then getting into the more precise and tailored measures, depending on our phenotype of the patient, MERD or GERD, what our um, manometry says, what our endoscopic findings says, for example, if their major mechanism is transient or esophageal sphincter relaxations, we can try baclofen, and then eventually moving up to the surgical um, modalities. Okay, so looking at my lifestyle modification, the only three um, interventions which have been shown to improve GERD symptoms is elevation of the head, left lateral to cubic disposition, and then weight loss. Those are the only three. In terms of pharmacotherapy, over-the-counter medications or antiacids, they do provide a rapid onset of relief but require frequent use, and in a meta-analysis, Gaviscon provided the best symptom relief. Um, obviously, it does not address or heal esophagitis. And then prokinetics, so metoclopramide, cisparide, and some cholinergic agonists, as well as macrolides. These work by increasing our alias pressure from that table I showed you in the beginning, um, all the modulators of alias pressures. It improves gastric emptying and esophageal clearance, so these seem to be great. However, their effectiveness decreases with disease for severity. Unfortunately, it has no effect on our transient low esophageal re um, sphincter relaxation episodes, which is one of the more common mechanisms for um, gastric esophageal reflux disease. And then it's unreliable on healing esophagitis and limited by side effects. So looking more closely at baclofen, which I showed you earlier, 
you titrate um, 5 to 20 milligrams T TDS. It decreases your transient lower um, esophageal sphincter relaxations, your acid and your duodenal reflux significantly. So it seems great. It improved your symptoms within four weeks to several months. However, it has major limiting factors is tolerability. So nausea, vomiting, drowsiness, presyncope. So um, companies uh, try to offset this by changing their formulations to a more tolerable forms so of R, baclofen, and placarbol um, were tried, but however, they were abandoned because they actually weren't clinically affected, although they were more tolerable. So uh, baclofen is the only one that seems to work. All right, looking at our uh, histamine 2 receptor antagonists, simetidine, ranitidine, um, nizitidine, they're more effective in controlling nocturnal than meal stimulated secretion. Um, so they're valuable for patients to add on as a PRN um, medication if they have breakthrough, um, nocturnal breakthrough, acid breakthrough on a PPI. So if you're seeing this on a, a 96 hour pH wireless monitoring, this would be something valuable to add on if you're getting breakthrough nocturnal acid. And tolerance unfortunately does develop is tachyphylaxis, um, but they're very safe um, to use. So it's a nice adjunct to use if you're getting patients that are difficult to control. And now we're getting to our main uh, member, which is the PPI therapy. So PPIs treat the number of acid reflux episodes, but they don't treat the proximal extent. So remember, the proximal extent of the acid exposure in the esophagus is actually correlates with higher symptoms. So they, people can still be symptomatic because it actually doesn't affect the proximal extent of the episodes, nor the total amount. So they are robust in treating heart burden, you know this, usually in one to two weeks, but they do not also treat regurgitation. They're superior in maintaining an intragastric pH of less than uh, more than four for a longer period of time, so 10 to 14 hours as compared to six to eight hours. And then a Cochrane meta-analysis showed that PPIs are superior to histamine receptor two blockers and placebo in both non-erosive and erosive gastritis. Okay, then in terms of erosive gastritis, a large meta-analysis showed complete healing of severe esophagitis after eight weeks of PPI use in more than 80% of patients compared with 51% of patients um, on a histamine receptor blocker and 28% with placebo. So we know they'd work. Okay, so they're more effic efficacious than our histamine receptor and um, antagonists in maintaining remission as well over, to, over a six to 12 month period. After esophagitis is healed, recurrence unfortunately occurs in about 80% of patients that have um, had severe esophagitis within six months after therapy had been stopped. Um, this um, led people to, or there was an open compassionate data from Australia and Netherlands, which led people to support indefinite PPI use for patients with severe GERD and esophagitis. Um, all these patients remained in a remission for up to 11 years. The relapses were rare, strictures did not occur, and Barrett's esophagus did not progress. In terms of American Gastro a Gastroenterology Association, this is just a quick um, guide when you're in clinic and you don't know what to do. So patients with typical GERD symptoms, which we spoke about, esophageal chest pain and regurgitation. If you do have those, a trial of PPI is approved for 48 weeks. You reassess their response in 48 weeks. If they have sustained solution, uh, resolution of symptoms, we wean to the lower effect, lowest effective dose and try to on-demand therapy or try to wean patients off PPIs. If they don't respond to symptoms, we check their compliance, check if they're taking it before meals. Um, and just to note, it's not FDA approved, but we can um, increase the dosage to a BD dose, so twice daily, or switch them to a more effective or potent PPI um, with a longer intragastric um, pH um, suppression, and then reassess the response in eight weeks. So we need to position our PPI use before we um, investigate for refractory symptoms. So we need to position them for success. So PPIs are labeled acid molecules. They're not constructed the same. They have varying levels of intragastric pH controls and varying levels of metabolism through our CIP to C19 pathway. And as you can see here, meprazole seems to have the best intragastric controlled, followed by rivaprazole, uh, omeprazole, lansoprazole, and then pantoprazole. I think we, in state, we use lansoprazole the most and pantoprazole. So we need to ensure that before breakfast or dinner, um, there has to be, uh, be meal dosing, and then multiple PPI switches are not recommended. If you do switch, you consider to switch with those with a greater intragastric suppression or that are less metabolized um, by the CYP2C19. Uh, 
pathway. So why do we need new treatment op options? So PPIs are prodrugs. They must be activated by gastric acid to convalently bind to proton pumps. Also, um, why it's important to do a pre-meals because in fasting, only 5% of your proton pumps are actively secreting, where with meals, 60 to 70% of the proton pumps are actively secreting. So that's important to reiterate to patients that it must be before meals. They have a very short plasma half-life um, and the stomach actively regenerates new pumps in 24 hours. So about already a quarter of new pumps are made. So repeat dosing is usually required and that's why there's the um, thought process or rationale for BD dosing, even though it's not FDA approved. Um, and then, like I said, there's more variability with your, meta um, your metabolic pathways. Okay. Then in terms of long-term PPI use, so there's a risk of cancer um, after H. pylori treatment, the enteric infections, SPP and cirrhotic um, patients, COVID-19, pneumonia, um, mineral and vitamin deficiencies, and as well as the, what seems to be in vogue now is dementia um, with long-term PPI use. So what has our community said? Most have identified um, most of these long-term controversies are weak associations in observational studies that cannot be established, that cannot establish cause and effect. The one high quality study did show that there was modest but significant association with PPIs with enteric infection. So that's the one thing to take note of that there is a high incidence of enteric infection, modest but still significant. And then we can't exclude the possibilities that PPIs might confer a small risk of all these other controversies, but we do generally agree that um, the well-established benefits of PPI far outweigh these theoretical yes um, risks. So this is what we should tell our patients. Okay, so what are potassium competitive acid blockers? These are Acid stable, they don't require any enteric coating, so they work quicker. They're active drugs, they don't, they don't need to be activated by um, gastric acid. They directly um, bind ionically to your um, potassium hydrogen ATPase pumps. They bind active and inactive pump, and there's no time, you don't need to um, adjust around meals for this reason. And then they're not metabolized by the CYP2C19, so they have less variability. In terms of the pipeline, this is where they are in certain countries. Um, very difficult names, um, not in South Africa yet, unfortunately. All right, so looking at refractory GERD, our definition is we just need to just clarify that persistent symptoms while on an optimized PPI therapy in the context of proven GERD is referred to as refractory symptoms, whereas refractory GERD is uh, your conclusive evidence on endoscopy again. So LABC or D esophagitis, recurrent strictures on endoscopy while on therapy. And then on your pH impedance test, it's your acid exposure time of more than 4% and more than 80 reflux episodes a day on opt optimized anti-secretory regimens. So your approach to refractory good will be the same as, as your approach to normal good, just going through everything again. Management of refractory good would be lifestyle measures again. Are you sleeping with head elevated, left decub um, decubitus um, position? Have you lost weight? Have you optimized their PPI therapy, changed their dosing to BD, changed them to a more potent, um, less metabolized drugs? Have you tried adjunctive and topical agents? So this is where you can tailor their medication depending on their conclusive evidence. So are they having nocturnal breakthrough? Is there major mechanism, a transient low esophageal sphincter relaxation issue? Then we can consider baclofen. Um, is there an acid pocket that's res uh, residual? Is there a hernia? Um, and therefore give them alginate acid, anti-acid combinations? Do they need um, um, hiatal senior surgery? So just to tailor that, um, this is where the tailoring comes in. And then looking at your invasive GERD management, getting onto anti-reflux surgery and endoscopic procedures, which we'll go through now. So um, your potassium um, competitive acid blockers can be an option for refractory GERD so that if you have severe reflux um, esophagitis and you're on a double dose optimized PPI, if they're not get good candidates for anti-reflux surgery due to their multiple comorbidities, if there's motility issues, um, esophageal and gastric, and patients with documented abnormal um, acid exposure on double dose PPI therapy with reflux related symptoms. And then who are candidates for anti-reflux surgery? So severe reflux esophagitis, they don't want to take PPIs indefinitely. They have GERD symptoms that they can't be weaned off their PPIs. They, do, they also do not want to take PPIs indefinitely. The regurgitation aspect, we know PPIs don't treat regurgitation. And if they have PPI refractory heartburn, that clearly is re a reflux related. So 
meticulous workup that we've gone through endoscopy, pH impedance, wireless monitoring. We've worked them out meticulously and made sure they haven't got a motility issue or another diagnosis. And then surgical options, so looking at anti-reflux surgery. So our classic Nissen 360 or to pay partial fundification. This works by um, basically reinforcing your anti-reflux barrier. So increasing your basal alias pressure, decreasing those transient relaxation episodes and inhibiting a complete LES relaxation. So it's comparable to long-term efficacy to PPIs um, in multiple randomized trials, and they may be superior in terms of symptomatic relief in refractory GERD. So long-term monitoring does show that, you, that patients do have sustained relief for up to 17 years of PPI therapy. And complications would be, if, you, if you've had a failed fundification, they need to have repeat surgery, re-intervention. They get gas bloat syndrome, dysphagia, and post-operative obstructive complications as well. And then you can also look at laparoscopic options. Um, unfortunately, most of the patients end up using um, concomitant PPIs anyways, up to 43%. And there's a 17 risk of recurrence of gastroesophageal reflux disease in these types of surgery. They can also consider Ruan Y, and this is primary for refractory, um, uh, sorry, a bypass for refractory GERD. And normally it's because of a failed fundification. And then um, if you've had a sleeve gastrectomy, which is um, resulted in refractory GERD again. Then complications would be, once again, the dysphagia, the post-operative sim um, obstructive symptoms, your gas bloat syndrome, and then re-intervention and re um, requirement for repeat surgery and risks thereof. Then um, looking at your MSA or your magnetic sphincter augmentation, it's a bracelet essentially of a, uh, or a magnet that's encased by titanium. Uh, it's implanted around the es esophageal gastric junction. And around 50%, 58% of patients normalize their acid exposure time and 90% halve their PPI use. So if you've got more than 80% of reflux episodes on your preoperative pH impedance testing, that presents um, predicts a more favorable outcome. It's particularly also favorable in those with regurgitation predominant symptoms and has it sustained improvement for about five years post-implantation. And some of your side effects would be mild dysphagia, and that normally resolves at around nine to six percent of three years. So this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. This is your ring. Um, this is the, the specific company, the Lynx ring. So you can see why it would work specifically in the regurgitation with predominant type. All right. Then endoscopic options. So anti-reflux mucosectomy. This is looking at scarring the OG junction or the LES. Um, so you're making circumferential or crescentric mucosal resections and improves it in your reflux related quality of life and um, the different options so there's band mucectomy and ablation using argon argon and their pooled success is around only about 73 percent um, i haven't personally seen any of these being done um, so i don't know if any of you have um, in cape town or in salem Bosch in victoria but i haven't personally seen any of these done it would be cool to see and in terms of complications, um, post-procedure dysphagia is only about 10% and perforation 2%. Then trans, um, trans a transoral incisionless fund application, it's a flap involving your 180 to 70 degrees of your OJ junction. It's, it's similar to a, a fund application that placates your proximal portion of your stomach, but endoscopically accentuating your angle of his, and then the long-term effect is not yet established. And then we can also look at G-POEM, which we do do at the GEN. Um, this is gastric per oral endoscopic myotomy. And that would be in that subset of patients where you have gastric motility issues or gastroparesis. All right. And that's the end of my long talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Jessica. I'm impressed that uh, you were able to get through all of that uh, with still some time to spare uh, for comments and questions. Uh, so thank you so much. That was really a comprehensive um, coverage of actually multiple areas within the topic, which, as we said, is quite a large topic. And uh, each subsection could be an entire topic uh, on its own. Uh, but I think you did a real nice um, overview, uh, but also going into detail uh, on the specific aspects. Um, I was very happy with the uh, how detailed the pathophysiology was, because that's really important in trying to um, distill patients because not one size uh, fits all in terms of treatment. Treatment is not just PPI for everybody. You know, you have to kind of understand the pathophysiology in each individual patient, because we know that the different uh, groups within the GERD uh, patient uh, group uh, respond very, very differently uh, to, to, to medication. And so I think um, 
understanding what the underlying pathophysiology is in any one patient will go a long, long way uh, in uh, being successful uh, in your management. And patients are quite frustrated uh, because uh, sometimes the PPI stop working or the PPI that they are on stops working or the dose uh, that they were prescribed stops working, but they still have quite uh, bothersome uh, uh, symptoms uh, and, and we are really unable to, to help them. So I'm just going to make a few comments before I open it up to questions. So perhaps uh, unshare, then we can see the chat. So um, please feel free to post your question in the chat or, uh, or if you're so willing, please put up your hand uh, and then we can ask you to, to ask your question. So very, very well covered. There's just one or two things that I just want to uh, just emphasize, I suppose. So you mentioned that GERD is really about bothersome typical symptoms. And this is what differentiates having reflux episodes from having a disease, you know, gastroesophageal reflux disease. It becomes a disease when you're having typical symptoms more than twice a week. So three times or more or more than twice a week. And when it starts to affect your quality of life, it actually stops being sort of a diet related reflux episode because of dietary indiscretion to actually a disease. And I think that's the one big difference. The second one is that you mentioned it, but I think just to sort of uh, highlight that is that with, according to the Leon 2, uh, you need um, heartburn, regurgitation, and now with Leon 2, they've included non-cardiac chest pain. In Leon 1, non-cardiac chest pain was not considered a typical uh, symptom. So it's actually three symptoms. Those are typical uh, for GERD. And then as you correctly point out, you've got the other extraesophageal symptoms. And as you correctly pointed out, those patients must be assessed by an ENT surgeon first, then you can do a gastroscopy, which typically is normal. And those are the patients for which, in fact, outright uh, acid reflux um, monitoring is, uh, is indicated. And they respond very, very poorly to, to PPIs. So that's a group of patients where you really cannot expect a, a very good success rate with just PPIs. And as you say, the management is slightly different. And of course, you would do gastroscopy in patients who've got alarm features. Uh, I think uh, that, 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 uh, that that's what we know. The other thing I wanted to just highlight is that you very nicely delineated the mechanisms. And again, reflux disease is caused by a failure of the anti-reflux mechanisms, not because there's too much acid. And the work of the PPI is simply to reduce the experience or the, the perception of the acid burning the uh, lower esophageal mucosa, but it's not because the patient had too much acid and now you're reducing it. You're just reducing the acidic um, refluxate so that the patient's uh, perception of the symptoms uh, is, is, is much better. Um, you did talk about um, a uh, hiatus hernia. So just to say that even a large hiatus hernia in its own right is not necessarily an indication uh, for surgery because some of these patients can be managed by lifestyle factors as well as appropriate doses of PPI and the addition of a um, H2 receptor antagonist or an alginate, um, you know, which will protect the uh, acid pocket. So there are many other ways in which one can try to manage even patients with large hiatus hernia long before um, uh, you, you set them up for surgery. The other important thing to note is when the patient is undiagnosed, so they have typical symptoms, but they have not yet had an objective diagnosis of a reflux disease, i.e. either endoscopy with BCD, as you said, or Barrett's or a stricture or whatever, or whatnot, or a, a pH study that's positive, you will do the uh, um, reflux testing off PPI because you are trying to make the diagnosis. Mm. But when a patient, when you think the patient has got symptoms suggestive of refractory good, this is somebody in whom you made a diagnosis before, an objective diagnosis, put them on BBI, optimize the BB, PD, uh, PPI, we can even talk about optimization, and the patient is still having symptoms, that patient you want to do the reflux uh, testing on PPI because you're trying to see the effect, the extent to which they are or are not responding to maximized a PPI before then you might actually um, suggest that you go down the route of surgery. And in that instance, where you're suspecting, uh, where you prove now that the patient has refractory GERD, so they have symptoms, you've done your uh, reflux uh, testing on BD, PPI, they're taking it correctly, et cetera, et cetera. Now you diagnose uh, objective refractory GERD. 
you have to exclude the mimickers, as you rightly pointed out, you know, pilosophagitis, um, uh, what do you call it, rumination, super belching, all those things. Once you've excluded that, then it's refractory good. And then now you can have a conversation with the patient about a potential uh, uh, surgery uh, if indicated. I find that our surgeons tend to be a lot more conservative. Uh, and in fact, they will say that really the only time that they subject a patient to um, to reflux, anti-reflux surgery is with very, very bothersome uh, regurgitation, which as you pointed out, can respond uh, poorly to, to the PPIs because it's the volume uh, uh, that is a problem, not so much the acid. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and then don't forget the other two categories of the reflux hypersensitivity you spoke about, and then obviously the functional heartburn. Mm -hmm. If the um, acid testing is negative, endoscopy is negative, and there's no symptom association, then that's a functional uh, heartburn. And in those two groups, functional heartburn and the reflux hypersensitivity, yes, you can do PPIs, but the idea is to wean them off as quickly as possible. And then you're thinking about things like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or modulators. Uh, that is the treatment. The problem is that 40 to 60% of these patients are completely addicted to their PPIs and they, they really don't like the suggestion that they should come off them. But in fact, the evidence that the PPI is actually going to help improve, particularly those two groups, uh, is actually very little. Um, yeah, lifestyle. I think lifestyle are second, first line, second line, third line, fourth line. At every stage of management of these patients, you should be encouraging lifestyle factors. Lose weight, sleep hygiene, as you said, elevate the bed, don't eat um, three hours or so before you plan to go to bed, etc. Those things I think are very important and can go a very, very long way uh, in managing uh, the symptoms. Um, yeah, I think um, those are the things that I just wanted to highlight, all of which you said, but it's just to sort of crystallize them um, even ah. Right, so we have a question. It says, manometric findings in patients with GERD include a hypotensive LES, uh, hiatus hernia, and defective uh, esophageal motility. I mean, that's true, uh, but, but Deirdre, so you, one wouldn't do manometry at the outset with sort of your run-of-the-mill everyday patient who presents with uh, reflux symptoms. Most patients can be diagnosed at endoscopy, or if it's a NERD, uh, they may respond to a trial of PPI, as Jessica correctly said, for six to eight weeks. You can optimize PPI, and that means you can increase it uh, to BD, which uh, Jessica has said is not uh, FDA approved, but it's something that you can do. Make sure the patients are taking it as they should. You'd be surprised what percentage of patients are not told that they must take it at least 30 minutes before meals, if not an hour. The other problem that you have with any chronic illnesses including diabetes, hypertension, and whatnot, but specifically with GERD, is that when patients start to feel better, and they do start to feel better, they actually stop taking the medication. So you have to ensure that, in fact, the patients are compliant um, and that the reason that they are still symptomatic is not because they stopped taking the medication because they started to feel better. Um, Jessica talked about the potassium uh, channel um, uh, drugs, but there's also, don't forget, uh, dexalensoprazole, so that's a dual acting PPI. Um, so because it has two peaks, you have longer acid suppression. Again, it's independent of meals. It doesn't interact with the CYP2C29 uh, pathway. So that was uh, launched, I think, during COVID. Um, so that drug is available in the private sector, works very well for healing uh, of esophagitis and all the uh, acid-related um, uh, disorders. So, um, so other than the PCABs, um, we do have the dual release uh, dexalensoprazole. Uh, I think the trade name is Dexalent. I don't like using trade names on educational platforms, uh, but um, it's the it's the it's a mirror image um, structure of uh, lensoprazole. So that's available uh, in South Africa and uh, is highly effective. The data is very good uh, for its efficacy uh, in 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 this group of patients who can be quite difficult to treat. Um. Any other comments or questions? Looks like you stunned them to silence. I think I spoke too much. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Uh, Pucalopride, you know, that is also used for uh, idiopathic uh, chronic constipation. Um, again, I don't know that it's available in South Africa. We don't have it in the in the public sector. 
but um, that's a drug that you're referring to that you can also use. And then also the baclofen, prokinetics and whatnot, those ones are generally uh, reserved for the refractory goods or the really very difficult uh, to manage patients. The data for, for their use is actually not great. So I think you'd only really use it uh, in situations where you're really struggling uh, and patients are just uh, not better. Uh, he's, he's saying risk factors for Barrett's esophagus in patients with GERD. So, it it's, like, <laughs> so it's, your, it's your elderly males, um, ethnicity, white smokers, um, obese patients, your traditional risk factors, that's the same. So it's, it's nothing to do with your volume of your, your reflex. It's, it's more your phenotype. So yeah. it's more corrosive gastritis, not your nerds, not your young female African patients. It's looking at your older white smokers, males. Yeah. Family history, et cetera. Yes. Um, but Dredden, we, I think in, in two weeks time, the topic is Barrett's. Um, so please, uh, do feel free to join us for that. Um, it looks like there are no other comments or questions. I will say, guys, that um, the talk that Nasif did and this talk, I think if you listen to both of these, you really have more than what you require uh, to understand this topic, You're both from a pathophysiological point of view and a clinical perspective. Um, and of course, the one that was done two years ago as well, is available on the Gaster Foundation website. So I think you've got enough material in terms of approaching this topic. And you can see from the three talks that the approach is different, but this is because it's such a difficult talk. Even when I give uh, a talk uh, on this topic, um, I, I find always a new sort of perspective uh, on, on, on this condition and how to manage it appropriately. So uh, Pascal- Hi, hi uh, um, Pichy, thank you. Pichy. Sorry to just uh, interrupt. I didn't like raise my hand or anything. No <laughs> problem. Go ahead. Uh, just a quick question to probably you and uh, the presenter, Jessica, and I appreciate the presentation. Uh, Non-cardiac chest pain. Uh, how far should one go before calling it non, like, you know, cardiac? Because the concern I would have from just a practical point of view, especially in a region where we've got a high uh, prevalence of ischemic heart, um, uh, like in a disease, mm -hmm. that individuals will be receiving proton, like in pump inhibitors instead of angiograms. Mm. So you're asking at which point will you say this is a non-cardiac chest pain and not a esophageal yeah, how pain? How far, if anyone presents with non, uh, well, with uh, pain in the chest and you think there's some reflux symptoms because the reality is you know reflux and ischemic heart uh, disease is like common so yeah, it wouldn't be unusual for us. these two quite common conditions to coexist in the same individual yeah so how do you go about saying that this person presenting with that particular symptom it's not like in you know, a cardiac. How far should we go? Should we go all the way to an angiogram? Um, Jessica, do you want to take a step at it? I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any right or wrong answer. It's really more about well, an approach or your opinion. So I think from a clinical point of view and being a safe doctor, I think when someone does come to you with chest pain, you look at the patient, their risk factors, their age, um, what is the likelihood that this patient has cardiac chest pain? And I think an ECG, at least a troponin and T are warranted. If you're concerned about chest pain, I wouldn't start a patient on a PPI and say, oh, you don't have um, ischemic heart disease. You're not having an MI at the moment. I would definitely do those two things first in the right clinical context. If it was a young girl, a 21 year old saying she has chest pain, I wouldn't necessarily jump to an ECG, um, but it's something an ECG or doing troponins in terms of resources. Um, but in the right clinical context, I would always do an ECG troponins first before I started anyone on PPI, um, especially in the, con and what, what you said, in the context where you work in KZN, where you have a high um, burden of ischemic heart disease. So I think to be safe first is to first do an, at least an ECG and a, a troponin level from my point of view. That's what I would do as a, as a clinic, as a practical standpoint in the clinic. Yeah. 
I, I must say, I would agree with you, uh, Jessica, that if somebody came into casualty with chest pain, in fact, yeah. for me, probably irrespective of age, but definitely more so if they have cardiovascular risk factors that are my consistent, um, I would do an ECG and probably a trope level. And in fact, that's what our casualty uh, guys do. That's what they do up front. And then for us, just from a practical perspective, in terms of triaging the patient, if that is normal, they will actually ask us to do a G-scope just to make sure that it's not coming from um, you know, the esophagus or stomach or whatever. And we do that and it just helps them to triage a patient, move the patient onto something else. And I think if the G-scope is normal, even a young patient, and there's nothing else of concern, then yes, a six to eight week uh, trial of PPI is probably um, warranted uh, with the symptoms, uh, assuming of course it's not uh, ischemic. Uh, and then whether that patient later on you end up doing um, acid testing or whatnot, I think it will still follow the same sort of uh, algorithm that uh, Jessica presented that if they are not responding uh, after six to eight week trial of a PPI and you've optimized the PPI, you've instituted lifestyle measures and it's definitely not cardiac, Yes, in that case, then I guess you'd have to um, to prove now uh, good with the normal G-scope, um, you'd have to do uh, acid uh, testing. Uh, and that patient will likely turn out then to be a nerd, I mean, unless the ARM is positive uh, and suggests uh, good. But I think that would be the approach. I wonder if there's anybody else on the call who would do things slightly differently. So I think it's kind of determined uh, for us in a sense by what the casualty people do. Yeah, look, I, I mean, I, I also don't have an absolutely uh, clear answer, um, which is how come I actually asked uh, yeah. the question. Uh, I mean, I would probably say, especially in uh, someone who's got even a risk factor, and by all means, I'll probably start them on a proton um, pump inhibitor, but I'll have a very low uh, threshold for uh, at the least an exercise uh, stress um, like a test yeah yeah uh, at the least and then then i would if the exercise stress test is you know, normal and they aren't one of our usual patients that has every cardiovascular risk factor under no, the sun, okay. then um then uh, after that, I would go and do, you know, if you're really concerned about uh, your reflux, go ahead and do your scopes and your pH studies and all of that. But I think yeah. for me, it's always that the heart is the uh, priority. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, from a legal point of view, you know, you don't want to be that one physician that overlooked a heart attack <laughs> or somebody who's got unstable and uh, like angina and yeah. gave them a proton. Yeah. So the heart takes priority, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, over the esophagus. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I mean, I agree. I think, uh, I, I guess w whether you do an NG or not, that will also be in collaboration with the um, cardiologist. But you're right. I mean, we know that um, GERD is a great mimicker of uh, ischemic uh, events. Um, but again, the the, the type of patient generally um, would alert you anyway to doing those kinds of, of, of investigations. Um, Pascal Kuka, thanks VG, uh, is asking if there are any head-to-head -head comparisons between PPIs and PCAPs. Uh, I, I, I can't say I've come across direct head-to-head -head comparisons because the PCAPs are kind of still new-ish and I'm not sure that there's been uh, enough data where the two um, are compared. Jessica, did you come across anything? So um, nothing, yeah, just um, experimental, not head-to-head. -head. Yeah, not head-to-head. -head. In fact, it's PCAPs uh, against H2RAs and placebo, but not directly against the PPIs. Yeah, I'm also not aware of, 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 of. But I, I, if I were to hazard a guess, I'd suspect that PCAPs would do better, as I say, because they've got longer and stronger uh, duration of uh, acid suppression compared to PPIs. Uh, without the influence of the uh, um, metabolism uh, through that uh, cytochrome uh, pathway, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, not influenced by by meals and so forth. So even the compliance would probably be better. So I think there's there's a lot of reason, sort of circumstantial evidence why the patients might do better on PCAPs uh, rather than our usual uh, PPIs. Um, yeah, so we are five minutes um, beyond our time, which... Uh, I'm, I'm quite happy about it. I thought it might be longer when I looked at the number right. of slides. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
So uh, you can take a breather. Well done uh, for a really fantastic presentation. And uh, I'm glad that you had the opportunity to actually do this talk. It's clear that you've put in a lot of work uh, uh, in it. And I think uh, it will benefit the people who will go online uh, to access it. So yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Um, so I need to just close and just thank uh, the Gastro Foundation for their uh, continuous support with our educational activities and uh, Project ECHO. I'd uh, like to thank the India team who are working behind the scenes to make sure that the uh, platform works uh, seamlessly. Uh, I'd like to thank all our sponsors that sponsor, again, all our activities of the Gastro Foundation. Please, guys, don't forget to register for the uh, Fellows Weekend, which is coming up. Uh, this is really the prime meeting of the Gastro uh, Foundation, which uh, Chris and, and all of us are very proud of. Um, and just to remind you that in two weeks' time, we will be doing a Barrett's. Uh, so please tune in, tune in for that. That's a really important uh, topic. And as I said before, all the um, recordings are accessible uh, on the foundation website. So please feel free to look at that uh, at your leisure. Um, yeah, with that, uh, thank you so, so much, guys. Have a great evening. And to our uh, Muslim um, uh, colleagues, um, wishing you the best uh, in Ramadan. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.